My Summer of Protocols project is a piece of software I am now calling Intertwingler, named in honor of Ted Nelson, who coined the term hypertext over 60 years ago, as well as what it means to intertwingle. Intertwingler is an engine, uh, much in the way that WordPress is an engine, that is, you use it to make websites. A question worth asking then is given that there are so many engines for making websites, why make another one? And the answer is pretty straightforward. This engine has very different goals. The World Wide Web is not the first hypermedia system, not even close. When Tim Berners-Lee uh, unveiled the web in 1991, there were numerous hypertext systems out on the market, including at least one internet protocol with similar characteristics. A few of these pre-existing systems were a lot more sophisticated implementations of hypermedia than the web was or even still is out of the box. So the web traded off quite a bit of capability exhibited by other systems for other desirable characteristics. How about instantaneous global publication? How about the web is extraordinarily versatile and can be modified and extended to do pretty much whatever you want? Everything you need to make a website is and always has been free or pretty darn close to it. It's really easy to work with, or at least has been historically, compared to other kinds of software development. So despite being extraordinarily complex uh, and sophisticated pieces of software now, once upon a time, web browsers were pretty easy to write. Uh, web servers remain fairly easy to write, um, unless you need them to handle particularly heavy loads, but that is not a web server thing, that's a server thing in general. Websites, on the other hand, have always been about the easiest kind of programming there is to the extent that people still argue over whether it even counts as programming. Perhaps even most importantly, though, is that the web is permeable in a way that its contemporary systems were not. It's cosmopolitan in a way that other systems are not. The web assumes you're going to interact with other websites, indeed other systems that aren't websites, email, telephones, Zoom, whatever. It assumes that at least some of these entities are going to be controlled by other people and organizations. It affords pointing directly at pretty impressively fine-grained locations anywhere in the addressable space from anywhere else in the addressable space and beyond. And the web accomplishes this using Tim Berners-Lee's most important invention, the URL. The benefit of URLs is that they do precisely what they are as uniform resource locators, they locate resources in a fashion that is uniform. A resource is circularly defined as anything that can be located or identified. So people, animals, trees, buildings, rivers, mountains, oceans, continents, equipment, etc. Of particular interest to us are information resources and representations of other ephemeral things. So documents, experimental data, events, services, products, companies, institutions, countries and other administrative jurisdictions, concepts and conceptual structures, and so on. The problem of URLs, at least those pertaining to the web, is that they foist the problem of maintaining their continuity onto individual website operators. And the individual operators, for the most part, just don't. And that is why link rot is a scourge. A question I asked myself early on in this endeavor was, as an individual website operator, what kind of infrastructure would I need to ensure the continuities of the URLs I expose? A separate and closely related question is what to do about links to other sites, but thankfully that's a handy place to draw a line on scope. I certainly have thought about it though. So what do the web leave on the table? Well, the web in its simplest form is just files files that you can manipulate uh, with a text editor that you get for free with your operating system. You put a file in a certain specially delineated place and it place becomes a URL. You point to other URLs by putting those URLs in the other files that you write. This is all very intuitive and easily understood. The drawback to this ease is that tying URLs to files and to a less acute but no less important extent DNS 
makes them brittle. If you move or rename a file to say nothing of deleting it, you change its URL. If anybody else moves or renames a file under their control, they change its URL. If a URL changes, you have to go and change all the files that reference it. Or you have to have some infrastructure that remembers the old URL and redirects it to the new one. This is a huge pain in the ass, so nobody does it. Because the web is rooted in files, moreover, it's biased toward big pages and not a lot of links. Or otherwise, links that can be easily sequestered, uh, like a navigation menu. I've remarked in the past that if you take the median website and clip off the navigation, the footer, and everything else but the main content, what remains might as well be paper uh, because there aren't any links left. There are other long-standing criticisms about this design strategy, including those leveled by Ted Nelson himself. Uh, so links only go in one direction, that is you can't tell what links to any particular piece of content. Because the links are embedded in the files, they can't overlap each other, so you can only have one link like per piece of thing on the page. Um, the kinds of links available to the web off the shelf aren't terribly impressive. So there's like the simple arc to go somewhere else uh, that includes filling out forms. And there's a rather naive embedding that just sort of drops the target into a rectangle on the page, whether that's like video or uh, image or another web page. Other hypermedia systems available at the time the web was unveiled had more sophisticated capabilities. Uh, the good news is that the web is extraordinarily extensible, so it's no problem to add these capabilities. And people do, but it's always a bespoke, one-off, ad hoc solution every time. Um, so one of the ways that I've been framing the Intertwingler project is to retrofit the web in some cases to lay a foundation for a principled approach to these missing capabilities and other cases are restoring them entirely. Now I'm going to tour some projects that I've worked on in the last several years and the challenges that I encountered that led me to write Intertwingler. Since I do most of my paid work under NDA, uh, one of the few unencumbered things that I can show you is my own personal website. That said, a lot of my client work, I use, tend to use my website as a guinea pig, so it's actually pretty representative. I went solo in late 2007 and figured I needed a website again. I hadn't had a website for a few years and managed to stand one up again by around mid-2008. I had had an idea at the time for what I called a resource handling and representation policy, which would be something like a manual where I would catalog all the strategic design principles that went into my work on the web. There's a handful of topics in the policy that are no longer relevant, like XHTML2, but the bulk of it, at least the parts that are complete, is every bit as useful as when I wrote it 15 entire years ago. Because, like, seriously, this stuff does not move fast. My vision for this policy was that I would write it in true hypermedia style. So topics would be highly focused so that each would fit on a standard desktop screen in normal size type without scrolling. All parentheses, asides, footnotes, and other digressions would be hived off to their own pages and linked. 404s are verboten, so that meant I didn't allow myself to link to a page that didn't exist yet, and the net effect of that was that I found myself having to write entire clusters of topics before I could publish any one of them. Under these constraints, I found myself continually having to stop writing and open a new file for my inevitable digressions. And then I would be immediately faced with the question of, what do I call it? Of course, with any file, you can't save it without deciding what you're going to call it. And since it's common pattern to derive file names from document titles, this means coming up with a title for the document. This is a major inversion from what we're typically taught to do, which is to come up with the title after you've written the document. And since the file name is also part of the URL, this is extra consequential, so you know, no pressure. I ultimately ended up just giving up and writing essays. So, at least approximately though, like for the file naming problem, one of the things I did was come up with a protocol to sort of name new files with a random UUID 
and then rename it later and then track that renaming. This is primarily what the first cut of Intertwingler did. Just before that, I had uh, plucked the information out of version control. Another big issue that I've needed to tackle for ages is just a review of the content on this site. In 15 years, I've written something like 200 articles, which I've actually published, and another 600 or so in drafts. I have legitimately no idea what's in there. There's things on this site that I've written multiple times because I had forgotten that I wrote them already. Now, I've worked on a few content strategy projects, and it blows my mind that content management systems, even the really big expensive ones, aren't managing content per se, rather they're managing files, and they're barely even doing that. Because like content inventories are mediated by spreadsheets. They are scraped uh, with a crawler and put into a spreadsheet. And they are bespoke things that specialists do on an ad hoc basis. In my opinion, the content inventory should be built into the CMS. It should be rolling, moreover, as in continually up to date, and not a point in time sample. And the same deal goes for the editorial calendar. It should just serve up a daily or weekly menu of content that needs to be reviewed. But of course that entails one system that houses all your content, which is a fantasy. But there's nothing preventing the development of a common data format for content inventories that can be pooled into a single location. I know this because I made one. One other banner capability for Intertwingler is the injection of backlinks into pages. That is every resource that is known to point to the page uh, in question. This is easy to do in Intertwingler provided you have the data, of course, which of course for your own site you do. Um, because under the hood is an off the shelf graph database. This means that links are first class objects and every backlink uh, is just an ordinary forward link just turned backwards. Backlinks are a key component to retrofitting the web. They are like the number one complaint uh, on the Ted Nelson docket. As you can see, I have some backlinks on my site. The layout is currently very primitive. I haven't done much with them yet because the predecessor to Intertwingler is just a static website generator, meaning it's a big chore to bring the backlinks on all the pages up to their current state. The new Intertwingler, by contrast, being a live engine, will be able to keep them up to date in real time. Another chore delegated to Intertwingler is the generation of various indexes. So perhaps one of the more conspicuous kinds of index is the feed. A feed's very simple, it's just a chronological list of articles. The wrinkle is that on my site in particular, I have, as I might have mentioned in other writing, mutually conflicting audiences. It follows then that I should sort the articles by audience and then have a separate feed for each. As part of the content strategy, I have a set theoretic model of audiences. Uh, most of the writing I do is for a broad audience I call Digital Media Insider. A Digital Media Insider is a person who works in software, websites, or other media production, but not necessarily in a technical capacity. A programmer would be a subgroup within this category. I'd say a Python programmer would be even more specific. I didn't say hierarchical though, I said set theoretic. Uh, so a person who does marketing at a tech company would be the intersection of Digital Media Insider and Marketer. So one thing Intertwingler does is partition content based on audiences, but also helps define audiences based on content. Another index generated from Intertwingler that is worth quickly mentioning is the Google Sitemap. This is another really straightforward one. We really just do this as a service to Google. The thing to point out here is that the, this is data we already have, it's just in a different outfit. We can therefore define it succinctly in terms of transforming that data from one representation to another. That way we don't spend any more effort on chores like this than we need to. And this I think is important. Like I think we should be treating metadata as something that we 
create for ourselves and then transform it into other uh, things like Google Sitemaps. Using the same set theoretic principles as the audience, I also generate a glossary for the site, which is also a thesaurus, and each term has links back to the articles in which it is mentioned. I do the same thing for a bibliography, though I haven't gone as far as a list of authors or people in general uh, that are mentioned in the articles and organizations as well, so like publishers and other employers or affiliations of said people. Um, again, or just companies that I mentioned in articles. A lot of these unfinished projects come down to the fact that data entry of this kind is inordinately costly. It's one of the major things I'm looking forward to the full intertwingler experience to provide, but I am getting ahead of myself. Another thing I did in my content strategy work is come up with a way to get a top-down view of the quantitative contours of a website so I could do things like show you graphically when you land on a page like how representative it is of the whole site. This page collates all the document stats for the entire site in a timeline but each observation is directly addressable so it can be pulled out and stuck on the page it refers to. Uh, again, I'd love to flesh this out, but until Intertwingler is fully serviceable, it's just too much overhead at the moment. I can show you the alternate view of this, uh, which I think is also pretty cool. It just sort of shows the what I called uh, block length, I think. It was a, yeah, something like that. It was like a block size. Another thing that I've been doing since 2008 is seamless transclusions at the network level. That is knitting pieces of documents into other documents in a way that the web doesn't support off the shelf. A lot of systems support transclusion, but they do it once again in an ad hoc way that's only compatible with their respective systems. And I was looking for a way to transclude content produced from one backend and into another. And I do this a lot. Like I mix backends and it works because HTML is HTML. I also started doing this in an ad hoc way, but I've since sort of formulated a principled way to do it. This isn't part of Intertwingler per se, but one goal of Intertwingler is to put all of the information there so you can use whatever transclusion mechanism you like. So footnote here, transclusion is of course another Ted Nelson term. Yet another linking type you don't see very often on the web is something called stretch text which involves collapsing nested layers of detail right within the paragraph. So when you click on the low detail text, it expands out a step. And so stretch text can be several layers deep and it's an elegant way to include detail that some of your readers may want without forcing everybody to read it. Again, I have implemented this on my site in an extremely cheap ad hoc way, uh, pending some better way to wrangle it. Stretch text, after all, takes some very sophisticated choreography, and much like transclusion, to do it right, I need to be able to point directly, that is, use URLs at a very large number of very small objects. And it would help if A, I didn't have to stop and think of an, up a name for each of them, and B, they didn't rot. So once again, the big innovation of Intertwingler is that it treats links as first-class objects and is designed to manage a ridiculous amount of URLs. So transclusion and stretch text become easy when you make the URL bottleneck go away. We've probably all heard the word metadata at some point, and some of us may have an inkling that metadata is useful for search engine optimization or link previews on social media. This is true, it is. However, I find the narrow focus on Google and or Facebook or whatever really sells metadata short. I believe that metadata is something we should produce primarily for our own consumption and we adjust it for other consumers like search engines and social media. Metadata is how, for instance, I dispatch certain presentation templates and styling. It's how I determine when to apply transclusion or stretch text. Metadata tells you what kind of thing a particular page, a piece of the page rather, represents rather than just paragraph, section, bold, italic, whatever. As such, embedded metadata is super important for Intertwingler. 
Sometimes to get the point across, text is not enough. Graphics are not enough. Even animation is not enough. Sometimes only a computational model will do, such as interactive models that communicate cause and effect by giving the user dials to turn and shows outcomes that correspond to something that they did, or simulations that demonstrate the statistical properties of dynamic systems. So it gives you a sense of the range of possible outcomes across multiple runs, or it shows you a sort of aggregate uh, outcome based on a sort of spatial thing, uh, or perhaps any combination of the two. Over the last decade or so, I found it advantageous to make models from time to time. So these are all one-offs. They're kind of converging on a unified design. They're still way too bespoke to be economical to make though. I would do these more often, but like even the simplest one takes like at least a solid week of tinkering. It would be very useful to have sensible decisions about data pre-decided so I could just focus on the UI and the graphics. Again, streamlining this process generally depends on being able to point directly at a very large number of very small things, which is, again, Intertwingler's specialty. Now onto another website. This one's called The Nature of Software. This is a serialized book project that I'm undertaking that reconciles the later work of the architect Christopher Alexander, a four volume monster called The Nature of Order. Uh, to the craft of software development. Like my personal site, this site is also generated by Intertwingler. I set it up so that I would have a place to put value-added resources for subscribers. One pretty conspicuous value-added resource is another glossary slash index, just like my personal site. This actually spurred me into consolidating five or six concept schemes that had grown independently into one gigantic one that I can slice pieces off of for a given context. Incidentally, this was a way bigger project than I had anticipated, but now I have just one concept scheme that is at the organizational level. I've used the phrase heirloom artifact in other writing and a big honk and concept scheme could easily be one of those. Like there's no reason why it couldn't last decades. Another thing that I think would be valuable for my own site, but in particular for the nature of software is an index of photos. So I use a lot of photos in the nature of software that are creative commons. It would be nice to be able to like attribute those photos all in one place. The role Intertwingler can play here is by making these kinds of excursions not take too much time. The big thing though that I believe the nature of software would benefit from is annotations. I want subscribers to be able to leave notes on the chapters very much like these asides that I have here. So blog style comments I'm just going to rant about this for a second. They're kind of a half-assed thing. Like the big problem with comments is they only address the page or they address each other if they're threaded. So they all collect at the bottom. And they also throw the scroll out of whack to, so causing it to misrepresent how long the main document is. New style annotations, so like Google Docs, Substack, Medium, whatever, they can address any point in the document, like any run of text including each other. And again, I'm sure there are all kinds of products that can do this, but again, they are all in the context of some platform. So either implement as a plugin for some potentially self-hosted platform like WordPress, or there's some janky SaaS thing that you stick onto your website with JavaScript. The data, moreover, is again, more bespoke bullshit. I just wanna remark here that there is an open exchange format for annotations in particular, if you can get that data into Intertwingler, it will turn that into Lego-like web pages for you. You can do whatever you want with them. Uh, this also goes for any of the hundreds of other linked data vocabularies out there. And if there isn't an existing vocabulary that does what you want, Intertwingler can help you make one. Which brings me to my final section. So this thing is not running on Intertwingler, but it's exactly the kind of thing that should be running on Intertwingler. This tool can be understood as a lab running about half a dozen different experiments at once. I made it 10 years ago over the span of about two weeks to test something and unsurprisingly it worked. 
the main experiment that through its success paved the way for subsequent ones had to do with testing a protocol for getting fine-grained structured data from the browser to the server without a lot of moving parts. As for what the tool is showing, the most familiar sounding explanation I can give is that it's a planning tool. I've done a bunch of videos just on this tool, so I'm not gonna explain it any more than that. Why I'm showing you this though, is that it belongs to a category of tool that I believe is underserved. All this tool does is help you enter data, and then it shows you back the data you entered. In a lot of ways, it's not much more sophisticated than a spreadsheet. It's actually a lot less sophisticated than a spreadsheet in a lot of ways. Where it differs from a spreadsheet is in its capacity to represent complex structures. Under this regime, every entity is addressable, meaning each is its own Lego block-like page. If we were to compare a page in this tool to a spreadsheet anatomy, each would correspond to a vector, that is to say, a row or column segment, sort of. Uh, two major differences between this thing and a spreadsheet. One, spreadsheets can't represent one-to-many relationships. Two, spreadsheets can't reference a multi-cell region without occupying the full space of where you reference it, uh, which is kind of saying the same thing. Uh, come to think of it, this is sort of an example of transclusion. Uh, one of my standing complaints is that doing data entry that goes beyond the remit of a spreadsheet requires purpose-made software, and in my opinion, most of that software just doesn't deserve to exist because it really is just facilitating structured data entry and its subsequent retrieval. We, we should have generic tools for this, and we don't. Instead, we have to wait around for some app vendor to make an app for that, and then the data we put into that app is difficult to use with other apps. So what Intertwingler does is create a generic substrate upon which that one can create these tools. Indeed, this prototype you're looking at, while it does solve the data entry problem, is much too sclerotic to continue working on. However, I did design it so that you can pull 100% of the data out and put it in a different system. So I can plunk this data into Intertwingler and it'll give me a bunch of connected pages that are otherwise totally naked so I can just focus on designing the UI. This is also true for Intertwingler, by the way, 100% of its instance data is totally transparent. In fact, this is how I intend to create the new UI. I generate presentation markup based on the embedded metadata. The challenge of designing tools like these is there's almost nothing to them besides data. So like you can sketch out a UI design and you think it'll work and then you try with data and it's no good. Furthermore, the data has to be real or at least real enough that it has the right shape. So the best strategy is to just get the data on the screen and move it around from there. Of course, to get the data on the screen, you first have to get it in the database. So this is sort of what this prototype was proving and then uh, the port to Intertwingler that makes it possible to use on that. The elephant in the room when talking about this kind of tool is a category of software known as personal knowledge management. So this is stuff like Notion, Roam, LogSeq, Obsidian, etc. Intertwingler is not PKM per se, though it would be probably pretty easy to make a PKM app on top of it. I generally don't use PKM apps because none of them so far have really focused on the transparency or portability of their data. Notion and Roam are both SaaS platforms, which makes them non-starters. LogSeq and Obsidian deal in open data, but once again, the data is largely untyped. And where it is typing, the typing is ad hoc. Like, I'm sorry, but Markdown has way too many ambiguities and not enough expressivity to be taken seriously as a data exchange format. JSON or, God forbid, YAML, likewise, at least without significant help. The problem with these systems, yes, even the open ones, is that the data semantics, to the extent that there even are any, are coupled to the platform. What this means is that to interoperate with these systems, to the extent that you even can, you have to go and read all their documentation to the extent that it exists with your own two eyeballs and then come up with a bespoke custom ad hoc adapter that translates your data into theirs and back. There are reports of people using GPT for this, but I really doubt that it's saving them any time. 
In other words, the value of the data these systems create diminishes sharply beyond that respective system's confines. This doesn't have to be the case. Data semantics can be defined independently of apps and websites. This is what open specifications do. Nobody owns email. Nobody owns HTML. You don't need to buy a license to look at a JPEG and so on. Intertwingler makes extensive use of open data specifications for the express purpose of facilitating interchange with other systems. It has always been a principle of mine to make software that is truly open with respect to its data. So where I'm at with Intertwingler at this time of this recording is I'm putting it together. I took some time out to reassert my point of departure and show some of the concrete problems that I've had that I intend Intertwingler to solve. So I will see you in a couple weeks with the finished product.